graduate program in public horticulture and am part of the marketing and communications section leadership for the American Public Gardens Association. We want to thank you so much for being with us today. We have 130 people registered, which is extremely exciting and beyond what we were expecting. So thank you so much. And we are also thankful for Eric Gensler of Capacity Interactive to be participating as our presenter today. We also would like to thank Jennifer Goodsmith and Erin Grajek, uh, who are the leads for the marketing and communications section, as well as extend a huge thank you to Bach Tower Gardens and the Morton Arboretum for their generous sponsorship of this seminar, because without, which, without their money, we would not be able to make that, this possible today. So just so you all know, this session is being recorded and will be emailed out to you with a copy of the slides next week. And if you look at the handout section, you can see the handouts that will be emailed out as well. So you can download that for yourself today if you would like. Please use the chat feature to let us know if you're encountering any issues. And then also please use the question feature for any questions you have because there will be 15 minutes at the end of our session to answer those for you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to our presenter, Eric Gensler. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Mackenzie, and hello, everybody. Um, my name is Eric Gensler. I'm the president of Capacity Interactive, and today we're going to um, walk through a presentation about communicating in a digital age. A bit about Capacity Interactive, we help arts and cultural organizations use interactive tools to engage audiences, build community, and market smarter. We work with um, many of the leading arts and cultural organizations around the country. Um, our practice is very focused on the performing arts, but we work with a number of uh, museums and uh, as well as um, Wave Hill, which has been our first uh, public garden um, client. And I'm going to talk through some, some case studies on this presentation around our work with, with the Wave Hill team. We also have a big education area of our business. Um, five years ago, I founded Digital Marketing Bootcamp for the Arts, which is a two-day conference in October, which is 100% focused on digital marketing for cultural organizations. And it's every October in New York. This year, we are sold out. Um, but we're going to be moving to a bigger space next year. And we also offer a program called Capacity Classroom. This is our, our conference room where we offer small group workshops um, to for six groups of six to eight that are focused on specific digital marketing areas. Um, right now, we're offering workshops on uh, Google Analytics. Um, we're about to launch one around content creation. And we're doing one next week around digital strategy for executive directors. So um, keep an eye out for those if you're interested. So the first thing I want to talk about today is that um, we've seen that many cultural organizations are not invested enough in digital media or infrastructure, and it's a real challenge within the sector, especially around organizations that came of age really before we were in such a digital first world. Um, making that adjustment has, has been quite challenging for many, and uh, many have done a great job. Um, but I remember when I moved to uh, New York City in 2000, this is what the subway looked like. Well, maybe not with the hats, but um, very similarly, everyone was reading the newspaper. I remember getting my New York Times and putting it in my pocket and um, reading section by section in the, paper, in, in the subway when I could have room to open it. And now, just 15 years later, uh, the, web, the subway looks like this. Everyone is addicted to their devices. We're addicted to our smartphones. Um, I downloaded an app called uh, Checky, and it told me, um, you know, you, you download it, and it tells you how often you're using your phone on a daily basis. And um, do it with caution uh, because it is horrifying. But um, I, I look at my phone on average around 130 times per day, um, you know, and I'm on it for, for multiple hours, and that's really common behavior. That's just, you know, how people are communicating. That's no surprise, I'm sure, to anybody. And this idea of the second screen, um, even when people are consuming traditional media, such as watching TV, the majority of users are actually on their device. So when you think of the idea of any sort of commercial interruption, it becomes harder and harder because we're frankly not paying attention to it. We're, we're glued to our devices. I joke with our clients that I don't, they should think twice about doing any sort of outdoor advertising because people aren't paying attention because they're texting while they're driving. Um, that's uh, not you know, sort of a bad joke, but I, I fear it, it's true. Um, there's a true dopamine response that people get when someone is responding to their social media or they're, they're, they're using the web. 
on their on their devices. Um, to look at some data, this is a graph of time spent with medium, so from 2010 to the end of last year. Um, and if you look at the bottom, that's time spent with print, which is on a sad and slow decline, um, along with radio. Um, something interesting happened in 2012 where the amount of screen time overtook the amount of time people are spending on um, watching television. And uh, if you forecast those lines into the future, that trend only continues. So on average, people are spending at least six hours on devices on a daily basis. I'm sure this is no surprise to anyone, but it's something to certainly consider when you're thinking about your media mix and your marketing strategy. There was a survey that came out last year that asked chief marketing officers, um, 600 of them, uh, do they think that marketing is expected to undergo a radical change over the next five years? And almost 80% um, agreed. And when asked what those changes were include, um, almost 40% said that digital will account for more than 75% of their marketing budget. Um, certain brands right now, like, like Pepsi, already has almost 75% of their budget on digital because they know that's where the eyes and ears are. We do a benchmark study every year at, at our firm, um, and we survey uh, performing arts organizations. Now I realize that most of you are not from performing arts organizations, but it does represent um, you know, how many cultural organizations are behaving. So I'm going to use it as a proxy to pull some figures out for the sake of this presentation. Um, so we learned that 56% of the organizations that answered uh, this survey, 56% um, of them spent under 20% of their ad budget on digital. Now this was at, this actually survey was taken in 2015. So this came out first quarter of 2015, reflecting on data from 2014. So only 20% of their budget on digital, half of cultural organizations that we surveyed. 40% spent under 15%. Now, when you compare that to this, that is staggering. Um, the idea that um, organizations are still investing in traditional media when the eyes and ears are no longer in traditional media, it's no wonder that we hear that so many people are having a harder time breaking through the clutter and in, in, in getting noticed. So we're at a moment of profound change in how the world communicates. We also learned in that survey that 56% of arts organizations say they do not have adequate budget to cover their website maintenance needs. So, you know, most of these organizations are now e-commerce organizations. Now, I realize with Botanical Gardens, um, you know, there's probably a far, a far smaller percentage of people that are, are purchasing online, but I imagine that growth is increasing year over year when more people are, are transacting um, and definitely learning about your offerings on the web before they're, they're coming to your properties. So what we talk about is it is profoundly important for every organization to become a media company. Um, the organizations that are succeeding in the digital world have adopted this philosophy. So what do, what do I mean by a media company? Um, I mean, if you look at like a newspaper like the New York Times, um, what do they do? They publish really compelling content that people want to consume. And by publishing that content, they're getting people to subscribe. They're getting people to, you know, in the old days, subscribe to getting the newspaper delivered to their house, but subscribe to, to get the content on, on their devices um, or, you know, sell more papers in the newsstand. So the idea is this exchange of um, money for attention. So in order to do that, the New York Times invests in great content and every organization in this world is now a media company. And what that comes down to is great storytelling. And storytelling is fundamental to who we are as humans across all time and, and all ages. And many cultural organizations are still storytelling like it's the 1950s or maybe like it's the 1990s. There's been a fundamental shift and how human beings communicate over the last 15 years. This is a slide of a guy named Seth Godin. Um, Seth Godin is the author of um, a book called Permission Marketing, which is fundamental to um, how the world now communicates. I read this book right when it came out, and it profoundly changed how I think about marketing, and really was the impetus that encouraged me to, to start Capacity Interactive. So Seth Godin actually spoke at our first digital marketing boot camp conference five years ago, and this is him. And Seth's book, Permission Marketing, um, is, is, I think is a must read for a modern marketer. Um, and what he talks about is permission marketing as an anecdote to interruption marketing. So interruption marketing is the kind of marketing and advertising that fueled really the 20th century American economy. 
It's the idea of if you're going to consume media, be that newspaper, radio, or television, you are beholden to commercial interruption. So it's 1950, the whole family sitting around watching I Love Lucy on the television. The first segment ends. And in order to catch the beginning of the next segment, you're going to sit through that commercial, right? So you have really no other choice. And if you're a company, say you're Ford trying to sell a car, if you interrupt those millions and millions of people, you better bet some of them are going to come to the, to the dealership and buy a Ford. So in this um, funnel model here, the top of the funnel is really the advertising or marketing budget. The bottom of the funnel is the people who come out and actually buy Fords. Some people are going to go out the side of the funnel. They're not interested. But uh, the more Ford spends on interrupting people, the more cars they sell, which allows them to interrupt more people across mediums. So take newspaper ads and interrupt people there with full-page ads or take radio ads. And that really fueled the, uh, uh, you know, the American consumer economy through the 20th century. Well, what happened? This is the TiVo, which fundamentally disrupted a multi-billion dollar industry, right? People were no longer beholden to commercial interruptions. It became far harder to interrupt somebody. Now, I think the most important thing any um, organization can have in terms of the relationship with a constituent is attention, right? We are in such an attention-starved world, and people now have such control over the ability to, con to choose what kind of messages they want to consume. So in the world of TiVo, fast forward the commercials. If we were all standing in a room, I'd ask now, how many of you actually watch TV? And then keep your hands up if you actually watch commercials. When I do that in, in person, the majority of people who watch TV no longer watch television commercials. But many of the marketers are still buying local, um, are buying local TV ads to support to support their programming. Same with Spotify, right? Spotify, Pandora, Songza. We no longer need to, to have any commercials. Um, or we can, you know, um, listen to Sirius Satellite Radio. And for a very low monthly fee, we are now in control of how we're consuming music or how we're consuming uh, talk radio. We don't have to have any commercial interruption. And of course, there's the delete key. Marketers have ruined email, in, in my opinion. Um, remember when emails used to get a 50% open rate? Now you're lucky if you're around the 20% mark because email has become such a vehicle for spam. Um, again, because people have full control of, of what they're consuming. So this is the idea of renting an audience versus really owning an audience. So the idea of interruption marketing is you're renting an audience. Who wins in this scenario? I want to you know, get people to come to my event. So every time I want to get people to come to my event, I pay the New York Times to take an ad. In New York, I would pay Time Out in New York to take an ad. I would take, pay New York Magazine to take an ad. And I've written checks for $100,000, and, and I've filled my event, as if I'm a big organization, of course. Um, I've filled my event, but then the next time comes around, and I need to fill my event again. And guess what? I have to get out that checkbook and write another humongous check to the media outlets because I'm renting their audience. They're winning in that scenario. And you as a cultural organization just keeps paying and paying and paying. So what Seth Godin per, um, presented in his book, Permission Marketing, is the anecdote to that called Permission Marketing. How does that work? That's the idea of turning strangers into friends, friends into customers, and customers into evangelists. And this is a model I wholly recommend that you as an institution fully adopt across every level of what you do. It works. We've done it for many, many clients, and we've done it for our, our own business. How does that work? It starts with really, really great content. The idea of you had $100,000 of media in the past, and you spent $100,000 buying ads to interrupt people, those days are over. Now, you take half of that money, and you invest that in hiring people, photographers, videographers, content creators, storytellers, people who are able to tell your story in a digital way, through compelling video, through gorgeous imagery, through amazing social posts. That is the content that's going to get you attention. And you use that content to get leads or permission. Again, permission is the most valuable thing you can have as a marketer. The permission of someone to open your emails, the permission to appear in someone's news feed, the permission that someone came to your website and you can target them with targeted ads um, you know, through retargeting, 
because they've come to your website and raised their hand that, that they are interested. And once someone gives you permission, you can't just spam them. I think, um, and this is what's hurt email so much, is these promotional spammy email. Email is, is content, right? And you should be telling your story across social, across video, across email with really great permission-based communication, engaging people, not just trying to sell them to get, to get them to come to your event. And ultimately, if you do a good job with this permission-based communication and storytelling, you're going to sell tickets. Um, people are going to have a great time, they're going to tell their friends, and that process will continue. They'll share your content, people will sign up for, for, for your, your emails and your social, and this virtuous cycle will continue to grow. Now, who is going to have better results when, when they're trying to sell an event? The organization that has 5,000 Facebook fans or the organization that has 50,000 Facebook fans? The organization that has 10,000 people on their email list or the organization that has 100,000 people on their email list? If you are doing any sort of interruption marketing, any sort of paid media, the primary objective, in my opinion, is to get someone to your website and to get them to give you a lead, to join you on email, to follow you on social, or to get to your website so they're in your remarketing pool. And then, of course, an additional first KPI is to get them, get them to attend and find a way to, you know, if, if you're not selling them online, find some way to attract and, and find someone to measure that interest, so going to the Visit Us page of your site as a KPI. But on that page, doing whatever you can to capture, um, or even when they're in person, uh, to capture their information so you have the permission to communicate with them in the future. This is a fundamental different way than how most organizations are operating under an interruption model. So now I want to talk about four areas of how this all can manifest itself. Social media, video, analytics, and lead generation. Social media, we all talk about it. Um, I think many organizations are doing it well, and I think most organizations can either improve greatly or uh, marginally improve and, and, and have a big impact. We've seen even minor tweaks of an improvement to a social, to a focused social media strategy can have a massive impact. Now, um, 71% of U.S. adults are on Facebook. That's at the end of 2014. That number is creeping up um, almost to the 80% mark now. And people who are on Facebook, the majority of them report using it at least once a day. You compare that with other social networks, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, that's a huge difference. In fact, three times more adults are on Facebook than on those other social networks. So when you're crafting your social strategy, a mistake that I often see across organizations is that they're everywhere and they're not doing everything very well. Each social network has its own unique way of speaking. Um, for example, on Facebook, you generally would not use hashtags. Um, on Instagram, it's so much about being visual. A lot of organizations are pushing out the same content across multiple networks. And we really say, unless you can do every network really well, you should only be on one or two. Um, one of our clients, the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, um, for I think six or seven years was only on Facebook and now has 600,000 Facebook fans. And in order to sell an event, we just need to post and promote an event to their fans and we can sell hundreds if not thousands of tickets because we've invested in that resource with really amazing content. Um, recently, we added Instagram to the mix, but it was only after a very strategic thought and consideration of the content strategy across that platform because Instagram is a much smaller universe of people. And then when you look at Facebook, um, Facebook has the demographic of uh, the decision makers who are generally choosing to go to attend cultural activities. 87% of internet users 18 to 29, 73% 30 to 49, 63% 50 to 64, and more than half of um, users 65 plus, those tend to be your donors or your, um, you know, in the performing arts world, the subscribers. And these numbers are just growing. In fact, the um, fastest growing segment is that 65 plus um, group on Facebook. And these are far higher than any other social network. I want to give you an example for one of our clients. Um, it's called Jacob's Pillow Dance. They're in, in the Berkshires, a small dance festival in the Berkshires. They do. Um, dance festival every summer, and it's a, it's a gorgeous, magical place. 
And we started working with them three years ago, and they definitely weren't a digital first organization at that point, but they've definitely evolved to one through really making um, a lot of tough choices and 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 prior you know prioritizing their infrastructure to support digital. Um, they hired a really amazing content creator. Um, they invested in uh, video. They invested in photography. And in order to do that, they cut their print budget almost completely. They spent almost zero dollars in, in print um, before they were trafficking ads in like 10 to 12 local newspapers, which was a massive drain on um, resources. And uh, they weren't getting the, re the results that they, they thought they could. So they made this investment in social media. Now. Earlier this spring, I, I went on their page and I, I saw this post, and this was a post that was not uh, promoted. You know, in your, you know, to support their festival and throughout the year, we do put money behind social, and I highly recommend putting money behind Facebook. In fact, I think that should be a primary part of anyone's media mix is sponsored Facebook posts, which I'll talk about. But this was an organic post. This had zero uh, dollars behind it, and if you look at this post. This was just on an afternoon in the spring. This video here, very simple video, had 27,000 people viewed it. 28 people commented it, and almost 1,000 people liked it, and it reached 90,000 people completely for free. Um, why is this important? Because the week that this video went up, a few other videos went up, and some really gorgeous posts went up. But that week, Jacob's Pillow reached a million people on Facebook. We talk so much about the importance of numbers of fans, and I think that is important to get that base of fans. But a real key number you want to look at is what, your, what is your reach on a weekly basis? How many people are you reaching? Well, that, that week, where they really didn't have anything going on at their organization, there were, there were no performances, they reached a million people. Compare that with the New York Times weekday print circulation, which is 680,000. That is an incredibly powerful distinction and an incredibly powerful um, result that can happen if you um, align your resources behind smart content creation and digital marketing and storytelling. An amazing storyteller is, is George Takei um, for the Star Trek fan on the call. George has um, over 8 million likes uh, on his Facebook page. Um, so George has the permission to speak to over 8 million people. And George posts stuff like this. I'm going to pause and wait for laughter, which I can't hear, so I'm just assuming that you're, you're all cracking up. Um, or this. This post here was seen, or I'm sorry, was liked by almost 126,000 people. 43,000 people shared this, liked it enough to share it on their, on their wall, and George got credit. But what George really cares about is this. Um, George is, is working on a musical that's going to come to Broadway really soon um, called Allegiance, which is all about the Japanese-American um, internment camps. And if you look at this post, which is just a picture of George holding a piece of paper that says this place matters, almost 7,000 people shared this. 67,000 people liked it. Now, if George just started a Facebook account and and, uh, and just posted this, would anyone have cared? No, absolutely not. He spent the majority of his time and effort giving things to people that caused a human emotional reaction, right? You, what we call thumb stoppers, something that's going to get someone to stop and pay attention, something that's going to be really funny or really sad or really inspirational. And we say if you do that, then you earn the right to put out promotional messaging. It's our 30-70 rule. So 70% of your content needs to be giving. 30% needs to be you know, promotional, or you're allowed to give 30% promotional content. So for all of the content, the 70 and the 30, it must connect. Being boring is a sin, and you must visualize everything primarily on, on social, on Facebook. Now, people ask, well, well, how do I do that? And it's so much about who you have on your team. Um, we say you have to hire a digitally native storyteller, right? And often find that from people who have graduated from journalism programs where they love telling stories, they're natural storytellers, but the journalism market right now is, is terrible and it's a really great place to look to find someone to, to represent your organization on, on social media. Now, of course, they need, you know, 
in many cases need to be managed and be given goals and, and KPIs, but finding that storyteller is fundamental to success in this digital age. This is a post um, from Wave Hill. Um, this was uh, just a gorgeous photo. Um, I think this is a thumb-stopping image. It's just a beautiful photo with a really simple call to action. And this was shared 21 times. If you assume each person who shared this um, you know, has four or 500 uh, fans or friends on, on social media, some many more, this has a pretty significant impact in terms of reach over 100 people like this with zero um, money behind it. And we'll talk more about some posts that, that did have money behind it. This, um, I've been showing this slide for, for a while now. This is from Jacob's Pillow, and I think this is probably one of the most successful social media posts I've ever seen. It has everything, right? It has a, a gorgeous dancer in an impossible position. It has nature, and most importantly, it has a dog. Um, if you ever want anyone to pay attention to anything in social media, just put a dog or a cat in there. Find, find a way to do that. Um, all seriousness, this is, a, um, this is a post that we, we promote every year. This, this one was not promoted, but we, um, we put this image out because it is such a thumb stopper, and we put this out to people who have never been to Jacob's Pillow. So someone who's really top of funnel, who's new to the organization, we use this as an acquisition. So we'll post this and we'll promote it to people who may not be a Jacob's Pillow fan or have not been to their website before or is not on their email list because the idea is just you know, top of funnel, break through the clutter, get them, get them to click that, that, that link to learn more about your coming to the Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival. Um, this isn't saying come see the Paul Taylor Dance Company, come see Pacific Northwest Ballet, because at the top of funnel, you can't assume those people, people even know what that is. This is speaking very broadly, um, talking about free events and performances and dance companies and, and the beautiful setting and using that gorgeous image to get attention at the top of the funnel. So it's very easy when you're a dance company because you have, you have gorgeous dancers. And I also say, argue it's, it's, it's much easier in your world where you have gorgeous gardens and gorgeous settings in nature. Um, but many organizations don't have that. And so what becomes really important is the, the, the copywriting. So here, um, you know, this is, this is a subscription post for Jazz Lincoln Center. But instead of just saying, you know, all salesy message, there's a voice to this. And there's a voice to this whole post. Um, and this is also an illustration of an investment in photography and graphics and brand identity, which is incredibly important to get attention on social media. Having a brand um, style guide and guideline to build thumb stopping imagery and to be really working from a foundational framework and not just pulling willy nilly imagery, but really having um, you know, a strong brand to work from makes you far more successful in getting attention on social. Here's a very small organization in Washington, D.C. that we work with called the Art League. And they do, um, they have a gallery, but they also do a lot of art classes. And this is a stock photo of, of, um, of crayons. And look at the engagement on this. 104 people shared this. Now, this is a po post that, that we did promote. But it's using a really great quote, a really inspirational quote, um, and really tying it beautifully to, to what they're offering. Um, and this did incredibly well for them. So this is an instance where they may not have that much money to invest in photography, but they're, they're using their voice, they're using smart storytelling, and they're using ass, image assets that, that are available to them in, in, in their budget. I want to talk briefly now about the importance of, of mobile when it comes to, to social networking or, or really to, to anything. Um, the, now we're in a world where more pages are consumed on mobile devices than desktop devices, which of course, you should um, be thinking in a mobile-first strategy, particularly when it comes to social posting. This post may have looked fine on a desktop, but when it comes to mobile, you have to push continue reading. I would say this image is not ideal for mobile, and it's way too much text. This one, too, is not using the, the interface of, of Facebook very well um, because they're linking from a third-party site. The, images is not, the image is not thumb-stopping. It's truncated. There's this continue reading. This is a successful mobile post. It, it takes advantage of all the real estate. Um, it's, a, it's an image that, that translates to mobile. Um, they're, they're, all the text is above the continue reading. The link is above the continue reading. If you do um, have to write really long text, we'd say put the link above it and then continue the reading above, below the link that you want people to click. It also uses white space really well.
Um, being topical increases relevance and makes connections. Um, very simply, um, calendaring what's going on in the world and connecting your programming to that. This is Palabolus uh, Dance Theater. Really simple, green background, St. Patrick's Day. I love this example. This is Lincoln Center, um, and this was during Shark Week. And this took about 15 minutes. Um, the person who runs the content and social media for, for Lincoln Center uh, went to the graphic designer and said, hey, can you Photoshop the shark in, in the pool at Lincoln Center? It got, um, because he had given the permission to be a little more, um, have a little more creative license um, on social media, he just, you know, ran it up the minimal flag chain that, that was required, and, and they published this, and this thing did phenomenally well, and they, they use it every year. Um, when the World Cup was around, um, Jacob's Pillow did some quick Photoshopping, and uh, we have this. Um, and I think many ballet companies are now using this image around um, the, the, you know, or did use this image during the World Cup. Uh, my point is, like, you don't have to wait until the holidays when you come across a really funny or compelling image that you think will make sense for Thanksgiving or President's Day or, or Christmas, start compiling it now, and you can even post it. Just just schedule it to to, to go live on, on on the right time during the holiday. And then really focus on creating shareable content. Um, I think a primary KPI, key performance indicator, um, is shares. If someone likes something great, if they comment on it, okay, they're more engaged. But really, the true metric is I shared this, which means it meant something to me, and I want to tell my friends uh, that, that, that this is something that's important to me or that's something I'm associated with. And really, this is the um, permission marketing um, friends into evangelists, strangers um, strangers into customers, um, and customers into evangelists. So this is the evangelist part where people are actually telling your story for you, which is the most powerful thing, right? If I say how great my programming is, that's one thing. But if your fans say it to their friends, there's going to be a far more higher likely chance that they're going to convert and, and, and come to your events or engage with your content. So another Jacob's Pillow post, 845 shares here. Um, again, actually, not another Jacob's Pillow post, the same Jacob's Pillow post. Um, this is another Jacob's Pillow post. Um, this is a, a post that they, they use everywhere, every year. Um, it's just a, a sign that they have on their property. They threw a tutu up on there. 300 people are, are sharing it. Um, I just spent about 10 minutes looking on Pinterest for, for fun garden things that you could share that I'm going to bet if you put that up tomorrow, you're going to get some serious engagement. This could be a 70% post. I thought this was, you know, funny enough um, that uh, I would give it a whirl. Um, I like this one too. I think if you just, um, you know, create create a universe where you allow yourself to, to have a little artistic freedom on social media. There are so many um, places, primarily um, looking on, on, on Pinterest for, for great content that you could put out there. You're going to have some, some good success. Um, I like this one too. I don't know. This one may be a little, little risque, but uh, maybe some of you out there. Again, this took me all of 10 minutes to compile. But really, it's just about you know, I said attention is the most valuable commodity. If you can use one of these pieces of content to get someone to like you, now you've had the beginning of the permission-based relationship where you can then start to tell your story and eventually turn them into people who engage with your content, who come to your events, who come to your, your garden, and who ultimately will become members and donors. So I want to talk briefly about a campaign we did with Wade Hill. Um, this was back in, in the spring. Um, it was a, um, this amazing uh, exhibit called um, Night Lights that um, was, was um, done by, a, by an artist. I'll show you in more detail. But I think some of the, the imagery was absolutely beautiful and the, the simplicity here um, of, of this social post um, where this post alone got 100 shares, 24 comments, 1,200 likes. Now, this, this is content that we did promote and, and work closely with, with the team from Wave Hill, and I know Mary and the team are on, on the phone today if there are specific questions around this campaign. Um, here's another social post, um, 200 shares, 1,200 likes again, 42 comments um, sharing. So this is really the case of leveraging a really positive review with a really strong image sized appropriately to, um, to sell more tickets and, and garner excitement for the event. Um, here's another one. We also did um, some video, which I can show you later. But um, what I want to talk about is the power of the social, the, the Facebook advertising tool. So, um, you know, in addition to strong content creation, 
and really crafting these posts to look beautiful, I say a social post needs to have as much um, time, energy, and care as, as what used to be in a brochure or what used to be in, in a postcard or a magazine ad. Uh, things as simple as the dimensions of, of, a, of a photo or um, the amount of text or what a link looks like can really make or break um, a post. So we spend a lot of time on making these content, the content really beautiful, and then we spend a ton of time promoting it to the right people. Facebook has such an amazingly powerful um, targeting methodology where we could reach people at all stages of a funnel. So people who are, you know, have never heard of Wavefill all the way down to the most engaged and um, send them content that's, that's related to them. Um, and then send them additional content based on based on their engagement. So we invested 50, I'm sorry, Wave Hill invested $5,500 in media on this campaign. And that drove 54,000 post actions. Those are likes, comments, and shares. Um, and it drove um, 200 online purchases. Now, we know that the majority of people are not transacting online. The majority of people are um, walking up and buying tickets at, at the door. But, um, you know, the only the only promotion we did for this exhibition was digital, and um, the numbers were, um, you know, the the campaign was incredibly successful. Um, the campaign um, increased the website traffic year over year by over 110 um, percent. 54,000 new visitors came to the website, um, and we were retargeting those people. So when someone came to the website driven you know, by Facebook posts for acquisition, they went into the remarketing pool, which then allows us to target them again on Facebook. So just so you, if, for those who don't know, remarketing is, you know, if you go to Zappos and look at a pair of shoes and that shoe starts following you around the web, that's really simple remarketing. But you want to do strategic remarketing when someone comes to your website um, based on what page they go to, you want to save that pixel um, and be able to target them in the future whenever you have something, something to sell. So by driving people to um, the Wave Hill website, we're able to not only remarket them through Facebook, but remarket them through display advertising. And then in the future, during the next campaign, we hold on to that, that pixel pool for 540 days. So anyone who came to um, you know, the site about white lights, they're now in our pixel pool, and now we can easily reach them with um, Facebook ads, YouTube ads, and display ads. So during this campaign, the Facebook campaign, there's a 9% overall growth in likes. So in the 200 online purchases are really only what, what we can measure, of course. Um, we, we know for sure that that, that, that influenced um, that, you know, purchases at the door. So when I talk about the amazing targeting for uh, Facebook, if the, imagine we're looking down a funnel here. Um, so top of funnel are people that may not have a relationship with you. People in the middle or closer to the bottom of the funnel are people who are engaged at some level, right? These are the people you have their permission. So they're fans, people who, who have liked your organization, uh, people in your remarketing pool, meaning they've been to your site before, and then people on the CRM list, which means that they, um, you know, we could take, we could take an e a list of emails, upload it to Facebook and target those people in the Facebook news feeds. They'll never know that they were targeted because they're on the email list, but that functionality exists. A little further up the funnel is lookalike um, models. So with the fans remarketing CRM data, we can run lookalikes. Um, it's a scary world where we're all 140,000th of a behavioral segment. And um, sites or companies like Google and Facebook know so much about your online behavioral patterns that if we, these lookalike models are, are very, very accurate and allow us to target people who have similar behavior to the people that are, you know, fans in their marketing pool or on the email list. So we use that target methodology. We also do interest targeting, which is, um, I think, what most organizations think of as Facebook um, advertising, which is a very sort of, um, you know, introductory way to, to use Facebook targeting. I think if you're going to do interest targeting on Facebook, you have to be very, very, very highly segmented. Um, you know, for example, with our theater clients, they'll say, I want to target everyone who likes theater, you know, within 50 miles of New York City. Go. Well, that's just so broad. It's going to be really expensive and not effective. What we recommend our clients do is look at their constituency. So um, for Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, for example, we know that 80% of the people who purchase their tickets are college-educated women over 30 in certain zip codes. So our interest targeting ads, we don't even target men. We don't even target people under 30 because we don't know they buy, we know they don't buy tickets. So we do college-educated women over 30 in certain zip codes. 
and then friends of fans. Again, the further up the funnel you go, the tighter you want to make those demographic parameters. For the friends of fans, I would apply those, um, those uh, demographic parameters as well. So you do that and you can get a really, really, really uh, strong return on your Facebook investment. Say for the majority of, of our clients, um, we see between a, for every dollar invested in Facebook, we see between a two and twelve dollar return. I mean, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Quick case study. Um, we really don't believe in buying um, advertising on publications. We don't think someone going to a publication makes them as good of a prospect for, um, you know, to, to attend an event as the data that's available online. So this is an example of a campaign we ran at the same time for a large New York City cultural institution. This was a display campaign on the New York Times versus a Facebook campaign. So during this campaign, um, the New York Times drove about 1.1 million impressions them through banner ads and through Facebook posts, 1.4 million. Um, the New York Times received about 2,000 clicks. The Facebook campaign, 27,000 people clicked into the content for a 2% click-through rate. Conversions. So everything we do, we tie down to back to dollars and cents. How many um, tickets did this sell? Well, the New York Times campaign um, sold uh, 65 uh, transactions for $12,000 in revenue. Facebook campaign, uh, did about double that. But here's the here's the kicker. The New York Times cost $18,000. We did this on Facebook for $5,000. So what was the ROI here? The Times barely broke even, and the Facebook um, was a three to one return. And this is very, very common because the data is so powerful. You can get your right message to the right people, and there's so much less waste. When the idea of the funnel, the top of the funnel is really shrunk because you're targeting the right people. Plus with Facebook, this campaign drove 89,000 likes, comments, and shares, and additional 1,600 page likes that will go into future Facebook campaigns. So here's the moral of the story. You're probably underutilizing Facebook advertising. It's powerful. Use it more. Um, so we're looking at about 15 more minutes of me talking, and then we have about 15 minutes for questions. I'm going to um, breeze through video here. Um, we know from many studies that online and video influences behavior. Google released a study from, from Ipsos Media um, that did a lot of research for, for um, cultural goers. And 45% uh, of people said they think more favorably about a show or event after watching a video. 68% says watching video influences a purchase. I mean, I know for myself, if I'm going to plop down money to go to an event, the, you know, before I do that, I'm going to go to the organization's website and I'm going to look um, do more research on the event. If there's a video, I will definitely watch it. If it's a great video, hopefully it convinces me to go. Um, we believe in YouTube advertising, um, the idea of those pre-rolls. Um, you can do results besides videos, and you can do results in search results. Um, for the um, Wave Hill campaign I talked about, we did run um, video. Um, Wave Hill invested a, a decent chunk of change in creating some really great video to uh, support this campaign. We spent $5,000 promoting it on YouTube. Um, we know it was responsible for, for 400 ticket sales just online. And the cost per acquisition, it was $20 per um, each one of those, those ticket sales. Um, so we were really pleased with how the, um, the YouTube campaign went. Um, and uh, YouTube is you know, owned by Google, so all the amazing data you can use to target your Google ads, such as lookalike modeling um, we, we, and remarketing, we use on YouTube to get the, those in front of the right people. And so you know, YouTube is essentially television you can measure. Could you get on television for $5,000? Just barely, and you're going to interrupt a lot of people who probably don't care about you. For YouTube, we can make sure those pre-roll ads are, are going to the right person before they watch their funny cat video. Um, and 68% of YouTube users say it's a place to celebrate creativity. So for a cultural organization, um, it, it, it's really a, a great place to be. So three things we tell our clients to ask when they're creating a video. Does it inspire? Does it entertain? Does it educate? If you don't answer two or three of these, you probably don't want to produce it. Um, the idea of the talking head sitting in front of a, a blank background talking about how great your exhibit is, it doesn't cut it anymore. You really need to invest in a really great video producer and tell your story in a compelling way. And really producing two kinds of video. One is the thumb stopper to get attention, and those are generally shorter 15 or 30 second videos. 
and then you can have the longer video that can incorporate some talking heads uh, that could be on your, your detail page for your event, and that's where more engaged people. You could also put that on social and target it to people who are more engaged with you who may have already been to your website or, or, or already like you. Um, if you're interested in learning more about, about video, um, there's a, a blog post on the Capacity Interactive blog that, um, that talks in detail about video strategy. And there's also a, vid, um, a blog post that went up, uh, I think, last week that's all about permission marketing strategy. Um, talking about Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, if you're, you're more interested in that, in that piece of my talk. Um, so we say this to our performing arts clients, the content of your video should be as compelling as the work you put on your stage, or perhaps the content of your video should be as compelling as the work you, you plant in your garden. I don't know, plants you plant in your garden. Um, a great example of an organization that has really invested in video and done an amazing job, and I think it's just inspirational for, for any cultural marketer, is the New York City Ballet. Take a look at their videos. They're absolutely stunning, and we work with them and, and turn these videos really, the, the return on video for, for New York City Ballet is, is, is really astounding because the, the videos are, are so amazing. I'm going to talk here quickly about analytics in our, in our last 10 minutes. Um, if your eyes aren't completely glazed over when you see the word analytics. Um, we know that about 9% of cultural organizations feel like they're using Google Analytics to its potential, which means 91% of you are, are feel like you're not. Um, but analytics isn't just a bunch of charts and graphs. Um, it truly should tell a story about user behavior. Um, but losing the story due to data overload is a common challenge, right? There's 64,000 lines of data here. How useful is that going to be in helping you drive your decisions? So we believe that data must provide actionable insights to guide your decisions. So um, we help organizations configure their Google Analytics accounts. We find that most organizations have just not set up their analytics accounts to um, track all the different kinds of user behavior, to integrate all their e-commerce so you can see how people are coming, if they're going to donate or buy a membership or, or buy an admission. Um, and they're also not tracking some of the micro behaviors that really are with the web is, is really all about, such as watching videos, scrolling through the home page as you see here, scrolling down the page. Those behaviors are not captured within Google Analytics, but with some really simple configurations they can be and give you a much more meaningful picture of how users are interacting on your site. So once we've set that up, we can then learn a heck of a lot about how people are behaving and use that information to improve that user experience. Um, for example, roundabout theater company here in New York, um, there's a lot of internal politics over what was going to be on the home page, right? Development wants to be featured, the shows want to be featured, the education department wants to be featured. But from our analytics, we know only about 20% of people even start their visit on the home page. So 80% of visitors aren't even coming here. In fact, most people are starting their visits on Google, right? Google's the home page of every organization. Um, the majority of website visits start here. And where are people going? They're not going from Google to your homepage. They're generally going from your Google to a deeper page in your site. And for, for a roundabout theater, it's to their show detail pages. And so this is when Cabaret was on Broadway. And we look at the show detail page, and there's a lot of text here. There's this image up top. And if I scroll down further on the page, there's this photo gallery here. And once we looked at the data, we started tracking um, the clicks within this. We were able to see that if someone interacted with this photo gallery, they were 13% more likely to buy a ticket. Um, and that's powerful. And what that allowed us to do was say, you know what, we need to move this photo gallery to the top of the page so more people see that. Because most of these decisions about where things are laid out on these pages are made by whim, or they're made by the, um, uh, the hippo, the highest paid person in the room, or the black, what we call the black turtleneck syndrome, which is the, the fancy designer you hire says this should go here. But really, you should be using data to guide the layout of your pages. Another example is, is the Park Avenue Armory, an amazing um, venue in the Upper East Side of New York that has these really large-scale, um, amazing visual and um, performing arts events. And if you look at the behavior on their site after we configured their analytics, we saw about 50% of their traffic goes to the season and tickets page. Um, so this is their navigation, and this is percentage of the site visits. Um, so only 5% of people were going here to this photo gallery. So when you look at that photo gallery, you're looking at these amazing photos. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to this place when you see these full screen? They're absolutely gorgeous. There's fire. There's all these amazing pyrotechnics and lights and these, these um, exhibitions you really can't see anywhere else. But it was buried um, in this photo gallery area. 
So what we really recommend is put that content that's really engaging where people actually are. Put that photo gallery on the season and tickets page to get people to convert at a, at a higher level. Within analytics, um, segmentation drives insight. This is again the Park Avenue Armory when we're able to slice and dice the data. Um, we looked at how are locals versus tourists behaving as a question. Well, we learned that tourists actually are worth 12% more than um, locals, and we can use that information to, to guide our marketing. So um, when you look at a, a web page and you say, you know, you open Google Analytics and it says, well, you have a 40% bounce rate. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Segment that. What's your bounce rate by geography? What's your bounce rate by device? What's your bounce rate by keyword or by browser? The segmentation truly drives the insight. This is a project we did with the Brooklyn Academy of Music. There's two ways to get to the, the meat of their website, um, to their events. You can use this left nav um, to the event detail page, or you can go through the calendar. Well, through segmentation here, we found that conversion rates increased dramatically when users navigated the calendar, in fact, by 31%. The problem was the calendar was buried at the bottom of the navigation. Only 6% of, of people were going there. So we found that move that calendar to a place that's higher up in the navigation, more people will go there, and hopefully you'll make more money. So what this is really about is the idea of evolution, not revolution. When an organization redesigns their website, which many organizations are, um, you know, we want to bring data into the picture, not just whim. Um, more than 75% of arts organizations are redesigning or redesigned their website in the past three years. That's from our survey. Uh, these are really time-consuming, really expensive, and often really frustrating projects that take you away from, from your core day-to-day. -day. Um, and oftentimes, this, this scenario plays out. It's 2015. And your website looks like it's 2008. So everyone says, oh, God, we got to do something about this. So let's raise a bunch of money. Let's go to the board. We'll get this huge budget. Then we'll hire this firm. And uh, well, here's where you are. So you know, 2008 is the left of that line. 2015 is the bottom. You know your website's not good. You know it's doing worse than it is. It doesn't have social integration. All this stuff has changed in the last seven years. So you go through this whole process. You spend a boatload of money. Lo and behold, you re redesign the site, and things are good. Everyone can go back to work, and the exact same thing happens again, right? Um, so this is obviously not an ideal scenario. What we believe is a, a more iterative approach, where instead of spending, say, you know, $100,000 every four years on a new website, you're spending $50,000 a year, or maybe those numbers are too high for you. So instead of spending, you know, $50,000 every five years, you spend $10,000 every year, constantly iterating and making your website better using data. So the idea of modifying it based on some of those examples I showed um, and making those changes and really tracking the results. Because when you do a massive redesign, you're changing everything. You're changing the navigation. You're changing the whole user experience. You have no idea what made the site better or even if it was better if you didn't measure appropriately. Um, organizations like Amazon, they never redesign their site. This is Amazon in 2012. This is Amazon two years later. Um, almost the identical website, um, but you can see really small iterative changes that they made using data here. In 2012, it said, uh, try the all-new Kindle Fire HD. Uh, two years later, it was still there, but they gave starting at $99. You better bet they A-B tested that and found that if they said starting at $99, they sold a lot more Kindle Fires. Here it said, join Prime in 2012, 2014, it said, try Prime. Much softer, but it must, it must make more people try Prime. Um, the sign-in was very small in 2012. By 2014, it was much more prominent. How else is Amazon going to know everything about you if you don't sign in? Um, same with search. Search was much smaller in 2012, but they made search much bigger, uh, most likely through A-B testing. Um, so my point of this is every time someone is interacting with any of your web properties, your website, your social, they're dropping breadcrumbs. And smart marketers know how to organize and arrange those breadcrumbs to make iterative changes to make their experiences on their digital properties better. There's a tool called Optimizely um, that, that is supplemental to Google Analytics, but it's A-B testing software that non-technical people can use. And what it allows you to do is make test small changes to your site and see the results. So um, at Capacity, we have a software uh, called Leadacity, which helps organizations collect more email addresses on their site to make them better at permission marketing. And I wanted to get more people to the Leadacity page on our homepage, so we did a little Optimizely test. We tried try it for free versus start your seven-day trial. We ran this for a few weeks, and lo and behold, we found that um, one version of that 
had a 7% improvement in driving people to that page. So imagine if you can make a lot of these micro changes um, just by changing language or button color or location of things, you can um, ultimately have more impact on, on the goals you're trying to achieve on your website. Now, I know Optimize is a little, little advanced. I just wanted to, to introduce the concept as, as food for thought for everybody. So I'm going to end with the idea around lead generation. Any permission-based relationship starts with lead generation. I said earlier that the primary KPI of any advertising that you do needs to be about generating a lead, which I firmly believe. The number of email addresses, social follows, and pixel users has a direct impact on your ability to communicate, cultivate, and drive actions from constituents. This is an old uh, screen grab of the ASPCA site. I, I use it because um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight places on their homepage that are really just all about getting your email address. Yes, you want to take the pledge. Yeah, you want to say, you know, use a cute pet contest, but it's really those things are all about getting an email address. Most organizations have a tiny, itty bitty join our e newsletter thing on the you know top right or bottom of their site, and that's just not cutting it. I would argue a primary KPI, a primary key performance indicator, if I was in charge of marketing at your organization, is I would want a weekly report of how many email addresses did we collect, how many new social followers did we get this week, how big is our remarketing pool this week versus last week, how many people do we have the permission to speak with. This is Leadacity in action, and um, this is on the, the, the Wave Hill site. And um, during the campaign I talked about that we did this spring, um, the Leadacity widget increased um, Wave Hill's email list by 10%. These are now people that, you know, where it's going to be much easier to get to their next event. Um, we are doing a promotion right now on Leadacity. Anyone on this call can have the widget on your site for free for a month. Um, you can just, if you go to the Capacity Interactive website, um, it, is, it is yours for free for a month. Um, so the, the, the Clintons and, and smart politicians really know the importance of lead generation. When it was Hillary's birthday, I saw this on, on Facebook and said, happy birthday, Hillary, sign her card. Now, does Hillary want me to sign her card? Does Hillary want, want you know, it's going to look at this and feel good? now? She wants my email address. So they're using this just solely to capture my email address, right? Very brilliant lead generation. You can copy this if there's like a, a really um, significant milestone or event um, happening. Find a way to, to leverage it to uh, to get more email addresses. Um, this is a, a website called The Skim. Um, I saw this on Facebook. It said Skim, the only way to become a better conversation starter. I clicked on it. Um, I subscribed. I entered my email address, and now I get these beautiful permission-based emails in my inbox every day that gives me the news. So in five minutes, I can be really aware of, of the news headlines. Um, the cost of anything free should always, always be an email address. Um, so I presented you a lot today. Um, I believe this. Um, all great changes are, are preceded by chaos. Um, I am I'm a nature lover and I'm an animal lover, so I wanted to end with a, a picture of my dog. Um, and uh, I think I'm going to open it up for questions. Great. Thank Great. you so Thank much, you. Eric. And we do have a couple questions. So the first one that was submitted was from Tessa McSwain, and she said, this is a great webinar. One question I have for the group and the host are, what are some strategies for encouraging adoption of a digital media strategy in an organization that is resistant or just doesn't see it as a priority? Eric, do you have any thoughts on that? I have a ton of thoughts on that. In fact, it's, it's, <laughs> it's such a great question. I thank you for asking it. Um, I think there's a few things at play here. I think any, any organization that's going to succeed in digital has to have um, buy-in from the top. And, and honestly, because we've confronted this so much, which is really why we're starting to do executive director training at our office. I mentioned next week we're doing um, Capacity Classroom, a digital strategy for executive directors. Um, the organizations that succeed definitely have a champion pretty senior within the organization. So what can you do if you don't have that? I think there's a few things. One, I think you need to start small. Um, and by that I mean set up a digital campaign that you can actually measure, um, invest just a little bit of money in it, and take those results to your leadership. Um, take them to the leadership and show, like, this is what we invested, this is what the results were, and I would like to, you know, have a little more budget to, to, to do it again. So start small. Two, involve your leadership. They need to come to events like this. They need to come to uh, conferences. Another thing we did at our, our digital marketing boot camp 
we had a, a you know a, 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 con, a promotion where executive directors got to come for free because I was so frustrated where you'd be talking to a room of marketers and everyone would say, oh my God, this is this makes perfect sense, but my executive director doesn't believe in digital, and it's like, well, it you know it's not something to believe in. <laughs> it's it, it's it's fact. So you know they need to to, to get invested. So sharing um, you know education with them or, or trying to get them to come to events where that could open their mind. And then um, the other, what was it, there's just one more point on this. Um, oh, using data. It's very hard to argue with data. If you can put together statistics around like, you know, our website has, you know, 50% of our traffic is from a mobile device and here's a screen grab of what this looks like on, on mobile. Uh, and, and, and our bounce rate through Google Analytics, we see our double on mobile, well, we have a problem. So the reason digital marketing, I think one of the reasons it's grown so much is not only where the eyes and ears are, but it's so incredibly measurable and quantitative. So if you can you just spend a little bit of time trying to craft a story using metrics, I think it, it, it's more compelling. So, so those, are my, those are my three takeaways. But believe me, you're, you're not alone in, in, in that struggle. Thank you. And our next question comes from Katie T. And she says, since a lot of this is about permission, a lot of the content you just shared from the Pinterest examples belong to someone else. What are your guidelines on using other people's content for your business? Where is the line and how do you recommend recognizing the original source? I mean, I think you, 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 know, you do give a, a shout out. Um, this is me. I'd rather beg for, for forgiveness than ask for permission to say that. On, on some level, um, I think you, you, you know, you try to be as, um, you know, ideally you should try to share and, and, and credit the original source for sure. Um, but uh, I think, you know, smartly, like a lot of those cartoons, for example, they, are, they have the copy, copyright in there. I think, um, you know, it, it's something that as an organization you have to, have to be comfortable with. And if you're not comfortable with it, it would be about curating um, some, some original content that has the same spirit as some of the stuff I showed. Okay. Thank you for answering that one. Our next question is from Aubrey Brennan, and she says, she asks, do you use UTM tags to track conversions for those ads using Google Analytics? And I, I think she was referring to the Facebook ads but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I, I know exactly what, what she's asking. So it's a really great question. So Google Analytics is a really amazing measurement tool once people get to your website. But if you think about your digital footprint, um, it happens all across the web. So on Facebook, it's, you know, it's happening across social media. If you're doing display ads, your, your ads are being shown across the web on, on multiple publishers. Um, you're appearing on, on Google keyword search. And unless someone clicks on one of those, um, those properties and comes to your site, um, they're not going to be measured in Google Analytics. So Google Analytics is great once you get someone to your site in terms of measuring the source. But for example, with a display campaign or even a face campaign, Facebook campaign, you want to be able to measure if someone you know, saw that content. They may have not clicked on that exact post, but a day later they may have come to your site and, and, and purchased you know, purchase an event ticket or purchase the membership. So you should definitely use the Google UTM codes to, 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 to measure, um, for example, your email, and you can, you can do it on your social. But for the campaigns that we run, um, we measure everything um, through conversion tracking on the platform because the platforms allow you to track click-through conversions and view-through conversions. Um, so there's a tool that we, you know, when we implement Google Analytics on anyone's website, uh, we use a tool called Google Tag Manager. Google Tag Manager is something that allows marketers to be in control of, of the conversion tag. So, you know, if you want to measure the, the effect of any of these efforts, like YouTube or, or, Cam, or, or Facebook or Search, you need to put a conversion code down on, on, on um, the area that, that's a goal. So ideally, if you're trying to, you know, get people to donate, you want to have a conversion tag um, fire on the thank you page of your site. Well, in the past, you'd have to go to Facebook, pull out that code, put it in a document, email it to IT, make sure IT, you know, communicates to the programmer, get it on the page, get it tested, and that's a very slow, arduous process without it hands the marketer. With a tool like Google Tag Manager, 
um, you put Google Tag Manager down across your site, and through this Tag Manager interface, you can actually add and remove tags and, and have firing rules. So in that case, once Tag Manager is properly implemented, you can um, copy that, you pull up Open Google Tag Manager, copy it into a tag, write the rule that says fire this when anyone goes to the thank you page, publish it, and you're done. So um, that's something that you know we've been implementing for many, many clients, and it makes a measurement much easier. And you can also, um, Tag Manager has this amazing thing called event listeners that can listen to any of um, the activity happening on your site. So if someone played a video, if someone scrolled, if someone uh, click through a slideshow, all that information goes into Tag Manager. And the beautiful thing about that is you can use all of those actions to fire different tags. So um, all the activity is consolidated in Tag Manager and allows you all, you know, all your digital platforms to sort of be communicating from the same playbook, including Google Analytics. So all that information is in Analytics as well as in the other platforms. That's kind of a long answer to a short question, but I, I hope that helped. Thank you very much. And we're because I want to get to as many questions as possible, I'm going to ask you, I think, what I think are two quick questions. So Sarah Leach-Smith asks, does Eric have any suggestions for tools to collect weekly social media analytics and keep them all in one place? Yeah, I mean, if you're managing, um, you know, a lot of, um, I'm trying to know, um, if you're managing a lot of campaigns, um, there's tools like Hootsuite and Sprout Social that have really great um, uh, analytic platforms that um, can help you can consolidate a, a lot of different platforms. Um, I really am a, a true believer that um, you, you know you should do Facebook and Twitter first, and only when you feel like you're absolutely killing it on those platforms do you then add in different social networks. Um, you know the Hootsuites and the Sprout Socials of the world are really meant for like larger brands that are managing a complex suite of platforms. So if you imagine a brand that has regional offices or different countries and, and, and is really expected to be across every single platform, that's when one of these tools is, is really useful. I'd say one of the other useful things about it is the ability to um, push out content to multiple platforms, but I really don't like that because I feel like um, your content needs to be created very natively to to the unique platform. So how something looks on Instagram should be very different than how something you publish on, on Facebook or Twitter. So um, definitely if you're looking to compile social data, those are two great sources, but I think there's, there's pros and cons to them. All right, thank you. And then we have a question from Scott LaFleur, and he asks, how many Facebook posts do you put out a day or a week? And are, what are your recommendations? Um, I think it really varies by, by organization um, and, and also, frankly, your, your capabilities. I see it a very basic baseline. Um, do, I mean, I'd rather see one really great one per day than, than three not great ones. But I think there's, there's certain times, and there's many different ways to answer this question, but I think it's very specific by organization. But if you think about it, very early, in, I mean, and I would test this. When do people respond? If you're posting very early in the morning, usually one in the, in the, the mid-afternoon. And I also find a very um, a time for our clients to do really well is in the evenings around like um, eight or nine o'clock when um, people are looking at social media before they go to bed. I also think it's really, really, really important to schedule posts on the weekends because you're you know, you guys are leisure activities and people are really thinking about what they're going to do on the weekend. So really making sure even if you're not in the office that a post is going live first thing Saturday and Sunday morning, so, so you're getting that um, attention. So I would say shoot for a minimum of one. Uh, if you can handle two, two really good ones a day, that's great. And if you have great content, I mean, it really goes down to your resources in, in, in your content calendar and then using the analytics to determine what makes sense for you. But I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. You know, uh, you know one of my friends is, is an editor of a, of a magazine at, at Condé Nast, and they post like seven times a day. but they have, you know, massive resources and massive content and, and massive things to say. Now, I'd also say if a piece of content is really good for you, like I showed with Jacob's Pillow, like that, that image of the dancer in nature, you can repurpose that and use that multiple times. So, or, or if you're publishing a really great blog post or have a really great video, you can promote those, you know, two or three times across networks spread out over time because, you know, if you have 10,000 Facebook fans, if you're lucky, 2,000 of them, 1,000 of them saw each time you post. So remember that when you're when you're scheduling your content as well. Great, thank you. And then Jennifer Goodsmith has uh, two questions. 
one, how do you know ticket sales are connected to each media investment? And two, you've mentioned a few KPIs. Can you expand on them or give a few more to consider as well? Oh my God, these questions are so good. Um, all of them, seriously, they're, they're so good. Um, wait, now I forgot the first one. <laughs> Let me do the KPIs first. The, um, so key performance indicators, I think, are incredibly important for, for all parts of, of a business. So if, if I was in charge of, of a marketing department, I think um, the KPIs I would want, which I mentioned, which I'll repeat, um, how many email addresses did we get this week, how many did we lose, um, how many new social followers did we get, what was the reach of each of our social platforms, so did we reach 50,000 people this week, 100,000 people this week, um, what was the page views of our, of, our, of our key content, so if we're promoting an event, how many people went to that event page, how many people went to the hours and admissions page. I think you can find, I bet if you did this analysis, if you said, if you looked at your weekly web traffic to your, your hours and admissions or your hours and events page where, where, um, and then pulled that alongside the actual admissions to your um, organization. So say that you had you know, uh, 2,000 visits to um, the, the hours and admissions page of your site and then 200 people came to your organization, well then you know there's a 10 to 1 ratio. So for every 10 people that go to that page, one person's coming to your 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 door or, or coming to your event. So um, that's just it, it may be worth trying to see if there's a relationship, and then you can really tie um, key page view behaviors to um, real real life actions, and then you can work really hard to to grow the the the, the those page view behaviors. So um, key performance indicators as well. I would say um, visits to um, like a page, like a donate page. How many people are going to the donate page? How many people are actually donating? You know, it comes down to what are the goals of your organization, and then um, and then saying what tools are we going to use to, to measure them. What was the second question? Uh, the second question was um, how do you know if ticket sales are connected to each media investment? Uh, that's right. So again, that's through using Google Tag Manager um, where you can fire conversion code on, on, on the thank you page. Um, and then also, you know, what we call proxy conversions, which is getting people, like what I just talked about, the idea of tying page views, um, you know, to events. So there's some art and science to it when, when you know, for performing arts, um, where 50 to 60 percent tickets are bought online, it's easier. When people aren't buying online, you have to, you know, be a little more creative. But um, through Google Tag Manager and conversion tracking codes, you, you can really uh, track conversions on everything. Awesome. And I, would you be willing to take one more question? We have several that will not be answered, but I don't know what your time is like, and I know we're at the time limit right now. So. I'm, totally, I'm totally fine. Okay, and would it also be fair to say that if there are any questions that have been unanswered, people could send you an email and get them answered as well? Um, uh, sure, 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 sure. I mean, yeah, I also should not have put you on the spot like that. I apologize. Um, <laughs> okay. So one last question is that you mentioned that Kelly Walsh said that you would give access to a widget for a month. Was that to capture emails, and can we get more information on that? Absolutely. So um, we have a um, widget called Leadacity. So you can see here, if you go to capacityinteractive.com, on our homepage, there's um, a call out to Leadacity, um, which is, is our uh, widget to um, get email addresses. It also can help you get social follows. So if you go to that page and there's a form on the bottom of that page, just say that you, you heard from, you know, you're on the webinar and you can sign up for a month free for, for Leadacity. And, and the, those email addresses go right into your, your email service provider. Great. I think that was a good way to end the question and answer session. I apologize to those listeners that didn't get a chance to get their questions answered. Um, thank you so much for your time, Eric. And thank you again to Bach Tower Gardens and Morton Arboretum for sponsoring this. So I think that this has been a great success. People seem to really appreciate the content. And we might be doing a follow-up. So we'll keep you all posted, but thank you for being here today. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And like I said, we publish a lot of this stuff on, on our blog. So if you, you know, want to go to our website and join our email list, um, you can receive all this stuff in, in your inbox more regularly. But thank you guys for, for your attention and for your really great questions. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And I'll, we'll call that the end of our first plugging in webinar. Have a great afternoon, everyone.